Okay, hello everyone. Uh, if you do want to hear me speak in Russian, you can do that on Thursdays. I wouldn't ask you to come uh, on Sundays at 10 since we have uh, something better over here. But Thursdays, you can catch us online as well. Um, I'd ask you to take your Bibles with me and open them up to uh, John chapter 17. That's the that's the passage that we had placed in the bulletin as a launching uh, launching point for us here. And so we have a pretty simple idea, a pretty simple idea that I don't know, maybe sometimes we lose sight of in John chapter 17. Um, let's just read the first the first few verses, maybe the first four. And I think that'll be enough to, to, to get us started. The Bible says here, this is this is Jesus. Um, uh, it says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Then the last, uh, if you look, hop down to verse number 23. Um, 23, uh, the Lord continues by saying, I and then and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. All right, so what we have here in, in John chapter uh, 17, the Lord is praying, right? This is before he's he goes to Gethsemane. But in these in these two sections that I've picked, um, you have two ideas that pop through. One is glory, and one is love. Um, in fact, the the word glory or glorified, something like that, appears in this chapter eight times, and love or loved, etc., appears five times. Um, another thought that keeps popping up in this chapter is that God the Father sent the Son. And that Jesus did the work that God the Father had appointed for him to do. What we see here is we see a complete um, agreement, a complete harmony between the Father and the Son. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, it's a place that perhaps you already know, where the Bible says that God, who in, in previous times spoke through, through a prophets and, and whatnot, in these last days has spoken unto us by his Son, by whom he made the world's. He's the express image of God's person. He is a, a, a carbon copy. He is identical. And I, I, I bring this up because I had a, a conversation with a, with a fellow who comes to our Bible study in Queens. And we were talking about God in the Old Testament versus God in the New Testament. And a lot of people, they have the idea that there's a big difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. Uh, it's almost like a good cop, bad cop kind of thing. God in the Old Testament, we know what he's all about. He's all about wrath and judgment, fire and brimstone. But on the other hand, when you swing into the New Testament, you get Jesus. You get comfort. You get compassion. You get love. You get, you get forgiveness. Let me read part of Nahum chapter number one to you. Um, because this, this illustrates pretty well, uh, I think, a, a, a typical Old Testament view of God. The Bible says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. That's verse two. You know what verse three says? The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds of the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea, he dries the rivers. Uh, the mountains quake at him. The hills melt. The earth is burned at his presence. Then we go with the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. At the end of that, uh, the last verse of Nahum chapter one, um, you have this phrase. Behold upon the mountains 
the feet of him that bringeth good tidings and publisheth peace. So you have a, a, a dramatic difference here between God being presented as the storm causer and the mountain melter and 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 the 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 justice administrator but you also have peace and you have goodness and so i say that because you remember back in in uh, in athens in acts chapter number uh, 17 where paul goes there and as he's waiting for his his associates to arrive he passes by and he sees an altar to the unknown god and so he goes up to to the hill and he tells the people that are gathered there the God whom you ignorantly worship, I want to tell you about it. Uh, the one you've been missing out on, the one that you don't have a clear idea about, I want to fill you in on him. Now, I don't have to do that here because, because in our case, we know who God is. We know who the real God is. We know the connection between the Father and the Son. But I think, and, and I, what I was getting to is the, the, the guy that I spoke with a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know what? I have, I have a hard time loving the God of the Old Testament because... He sees him as being so unlike Jesus in the New Testament. Now, we're familiar with the fact that we have to protect Christ's divinity. You know, there are those other groups that walk around uh, and try to try to uh, what well, they do claim that Jesus is less than the father, that he's God light or, uh, or a half God or something. He's not equal to the father. And so we absolutely uh, spend some time talking about, no, Christ is equal to the Father in every attribute, his power, his justice, his, his eternality. Um, there, there, there is no difference. You know, even if we want to talk, talk about, uh, if you want to say that the Father and the Son are, are two sides of the same coin, again, using the, the good cop, bad cop thing, well, maybe they just work together, but they have different methods of going about things. And so what I want to do today is I want to point out some places in the scripture that indicate that just like Jesus is identical to the Father um, in his attributes, in his nature, uh, you know, he is the express image. There's no shadow. There's no difference. There's no diminishing. Uh, there is there is no difference between who the Father is and who the Son is, except, you know, for their position. But I also want to go out and, 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 and hit it from the other direction. And that is that as loving, as compassionate, as kind, as long-suffering, as forgiving, as Jesus Christ is portrayed in the New Testament, the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah, is the same way. The same God. And I think oftentimes what we do is, is we don't have a problem elevating Christ and, and, and giving him the glory due unto his name. But I think oddly enough, sometimes the father takes a bad rap. For example, we, just, we read the section in Nahum, right? When you think, when other people uh, think about God in the Old Testament, you know, what comes to mind? Well, one thing that comes to mind is the flood. Bam! He destroyed every living thing, everything that breathed except for those who were on the ark. That's serious, right? We think about Sodom and Gomorrah, again, vaporizing them uh, because, of, because of their wickedness. Uh, people think about the law, the Old Testament law. Man alive, you stepped out of line in the Old Testament law and you could, you could expect uh, not a block party, but a rock party, you know? Uh, it, was, it was death. <laughs> Or all kinds of stuff. And then, of course, you have uh, another one that I came up with. Here's one you hear sometimes. The Canaanites. The genocide. The utter destruction of all the Canaanites in the land. How can God be good, righteous, holy, just if he's going to not only you know, look the other way, but if he's going to direct the Israelites, his people, to exterminate those who were living there? Okay, well, you know, without going into a lot of detail, God did send the flood, but he also sent a warning a long time before the flood came. And not only did he send a warning, he also had an example, Noah, and he also had Noah build an ark. And that ark could have held anybody who wanted to get on it. So while we see God's judgment, let's not let, you know, what actually ended up happening wash away what could have happened. If people would have heeded the warning that God sent to them, you talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, that was uh, that was very dramatic, right? 
But God did have a man in the city that the Bible calls was a righteous man. That was Lot. And the Bible says that he was his righteous soul was grieved from day to day with the things that he saw. He did, when he sent the angels there, he did tell them, you have anybody in this city? Go get them and get them out. And Lot tried, but it was too little too late at that point. And Lot left just with his wife and, and, and with his two daughters, you know. But not only that, you also had before God went to, to, to Sodom, he stopped and he spoke to Abraham. Why did he speak to Abraham? Abraham or Abram, I'm going to go see if it's as bad as I think it is. If you want to put that in a euphemistically, God already knew what the deal was. But he stops to and he see, visits Abraham and he says, I'm going over there. He gives Abraham a chance to ask for mercy, and Abraham does. And so, you know, they begin that negotiation process where, where Abraham starts asking before God stops lowering the bar. And so you see God goes out of his way to present opportunities for his people to intercede, to, to, to make a difference. The Canaanites, who did God? We don't know how many people God sent to the Canaanites. We do know this. Rahab was saved from Jericho and became part of the, the lineage of the Savior. So, so no matter what you look at, and, and above all of this, you have the fact that obviously Jesus died on the cross. Obviously, you know, you have the repentance of, of uh, uh, Nineveh when God was ready to destroy that city. Just like they turned to God and, and God spared them, would he not have done the same? for Sodom or Gomorrah? Would he not have done the same even for the Canaanites had they not reached that point? You know, and, and the book of Romans describes it in, in Romans chapter one, where a heart that deliberately refuses to honor God, that refuses to worship him as God, that refuses to acknowledge him as the source of all things, how that heart begins that spiral that eventually results in a place where God just says, okay, I'm not, I'm not fooling with you anymore. I'm, I'm not going to knock on your heart's door any longer. I'm not going to work with you. You know, in the, in the back in, in Genesis 6, before the flood, God said, my spirit won't always strive with man. He gave them, you know, another 120 years. But on an individual level, you know, nowadays, especially when we don't mostly live to see 120, uh, he really can't, really can't give us that long. My point is, you see... You see God compassionate, long-suffering, just like you see Jesus. Now, let's, let's go through some stuff here. Um, we read this section here in John because Jesus said, you know, the work that I came to do is the work that my Father gave me to do. Let me read a couple more passages for you. John 14, 10. I'm sorry. John 14, 9. You remember this one, right? Jesus had been speaking with his disciples. He starts out and in the first part of the chapter, talking about let not your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. He talks about the Father, and Philip says, oh, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll suffice us. I mean, that's all we want. We just want a glimpse of the Father. And Jesus says, I've been such a long time with you. Have you not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. John chapter 8, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. You know, twice we had the, the testimony, the audible testimony of the Father from heaven at Christ's baptism and then on the transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom eh, sometimes we have our disagreements, but we're more or less on the same page. That's not what he said. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus said on more than one occasion, the things that I do, I have seen of my Father. It's He that does the works that I'm doing. The things that I say, they're not things that, I, that are original with me. My Father has taught me these things. And so, 
when Jesus touched the untouchable and healed the leper. You know, the Bible says Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, touched him and said, I will be thou clean. When Jesus did that, the father was pleased. That's what God wanted him to do. When little children were brought to him to bless and he took them up in his arms and put his hands on them and blessed them. The father was pleased. That's what he wanted Jesus to do. When Jesus in Luke 10 told the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, one of the one of the best known uh, parables about how we ought to go out of our way to help whomever, wherever. Right. Those are the words that the father wanted him to say. And he was pleased with that. Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son, what we like to call it. You know, the son that went in the far country and and uh, and demanded his inheritance ahead of time and lost it all in riotous living and came stumbling, staggering back home, you know, just a, a, a shell maybe of what he had been. And the father went out to meet him. That chapter, Jesus, as part of that trifold parable, Jesus says three times that there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. But when Jesus told that part of the parable, the father was pleased. Those are the words that the father wanted the son to say. At the end, uh, after Jesus has entered Jerusalem for about the last time, and he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her ch chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Those are the words that the father wanted Jesus to say. And in fact, this, this image of a, of, a, of a bird or a, of a chicken gathering young ones or brood under their wings, that shows up seven times in the Old Testament. Once in Ruth, six times in Psalms. Every good thing that Jesus did, the Father wanted him to do. Every compassionate thing that Jesus said, the Father wanted him to say. There is no difference between the Father and the Son in that way. Now, again, talk about Jesus, right? We understand Jesus, and he, uh, you know, we read that section in Nahum. We, we, when we think of Jesus, we think about somebody who calms storms. He doesn't cause them. Right. It's not the mountains melting and and everything being up uh, topsy turvy. Uh, Jesus is 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 different, but he's not. You know, Jesus did pronounce woe upon the scribes and the Pharisees, and he really let them have it in Matthew 23. He said they were not of God. This is a mix of Matthew and John. They were hypocrites. They were the children of hell. They had the devil for their father. He called them serpents and vipers. And asked, how could they expect to escape the damnation of hell? This is Jesus speaking. And not only did he say things like that, you know, he did cleanse the temple a couple times. Made a scourge of small cords, drove them out of the temple, drove out the sheep, the oxen, poured out the changers' money, overthrew their tables. Not what we want to have happen on the 25th, right? But he did do that. There were presents. Oh, by the way, you know, Jesus cleansed the temple. It was his father's place. Where is the temple of God nowadays? If you're saved, it's inside of you. Inside of you. And Jesus is not going to have any more patience, any more. I mean, he obviously Jesus didn't go cleanse the temple every day. You know, we read about it twice happening during his ministry. But he still feels about a filthy temple now the same way that he did then. And the day will come. When he will cleanse it, uh, whether it's here on this on this sphere or when we stand before him uh, and things are cast into the fire to see what what comes out, what what withstands his judgment. So Jesus, then it's in Luke chapter 13, where people told him about current events. You know, I like current events, I like using historical stuff and things that maybe people are thinking about to connect them with the timeless truths that we find here in the Bible. You know, when people came to Jesus and talked to, to him about uh, some Galilean people that had, had their blood mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus asked them, he said, do you think that they were worse sinners than anybody else because that happened to them? Nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He said that twice. 
So you have Jesus. I mean, it's it's not always kind and calm and welcoming and 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 whatnot. You have judgment as well. You have you have serious things happening here. John chapter five, Jesus said this: For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. Now that being the case. You remember in Matthew chapter 25, the end of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus, the Bible talks about the Son of Man comes back, power, glory. And then the king sits on his throne and all nations are gathered before him and he separates them one from the other like a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And to the one hand, he says, welcome or, you know, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And it's all good. But the other, maybe not half, the other side, which is maybe a whole lot bigger than the other side, we don't know. But to the other side, he says to them, depart, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Who says that? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. In 2 Thessalonians, he comes with his, he's revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God. And obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians, the Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ is the word. That we can everyone will receive what we've done, whether it be good or bad. And so my point is, when we think about these judgments that will come on the earth, it's a it's it's a facet of Jesus that he just hasn't shown so much yet, right? Because when he first came, it was the time of for repentance. It was the the summer of God's uh, you know forgiveness. When he comes at the end to close up shop, to settle accounts, it's going to be the same Jesus, but in a way that people haven't seen him before. The Bible declares it right this is nothing new that we've just unearthed someplace it's always been here but in the popular mind you know as people think here's god ooh watch out for him here's jesus boy i i like him he 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 he's much more accommodating he's much more forgiving but you know what in revelation 6 the bible says that the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the captains and the mighty men and the bond and the free they will hide themselves in the dens and rocks of the mountains and say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Different, different dynamic than what the world is used to. Behold, Revelation 1, 7, every eye, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. I'm not talking about the Father. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. They don't welcome him as comforter, as savior, as shepherd, as advocate. He doesn't come as a gentle shepherd this time. He comes as the judge of sinners. He doesn't come to be crucified again between two thieves. But like we've already said, he comes to separate all the nations into two groups, the sheep and the goats, and receive one group into the, his heavenly kingdom and consign the other group to the hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's Jesus. Now, that being said, we see the other side of Jesus. And as we wrap things up, and we are rounding, uh, rounding the final turn here, although I've got some scripture left. Ezekiel chapter 8, uh, I'm sorry, 33. It's in 18 also. The Bible says this, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Now, this is what God the Father says in the Old Testament. I have no pleasure. That's not what I want. His love encompasses the, the world. Christ died to pay for the sins of the world. Isaiah, the Lord says, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there's none else. All the ends of the earth. Did that ever include Canaan, perhaps? Yeah, it did at one time. Until they crossed the line, wherever that line was. 
Isaiah chapter 61. This is uh, Jesus quoted, you know, he stood up in the synagogue uh, in Nazareth and when they gave him the book, which happened to be Isaiah, uh, and then he read, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me. Okay, we get that. Let's not forget, let's not lose sight of the fact that God the Father anointed Jesus to do some things. What did he anoint him to do? He anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where Jesus closed the book. But if he'd gone a little further, the next phrase is, and the day of vengeance of our God. That's just inserted there. You've got a paragraph, you've got that phrase, and then it goes right back to, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. It was God the Father that anointed Jesus and sent him to preach and heal and welcome and die on the cross. This is the God of the Old Testament. And along with where it says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, you know, we understand as we, you know, this is mostly between the Father and the Son, but the Holy Spirit, how does he manifest himself? What are the fruits of the Spirit? Aggression, bad attitudes, hard to get along with, self no. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So you have God the Father, and you have God the Son, and you have God the Holy Spirit, and they're all, they're all, they're the same. I mean, yeah, they're different. The Father's not the Son. Right, there's a trinity. But who they are, it's the same. Old Testament, New Testament, future eternity, they're the same. How about this? Read a few verses and we'll be done. Micah chapter 7. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Do you think about the God of the Old Testament delighting in mercy? He does not willing. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it has to happen. But he has no pleasure in that. He wants people to turn. He wants to cast their, their sins into the sea, not cast their souls into hell. How about this one from Isaiah? Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come, buy, eat. Why do you spend money for that which isn't bread? Why do you labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Hearken diligently unto me, eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Psalm uh, 85 Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Give thy strength unto thy servant. It's kind of like Psalm, or I'm sorry, like Isaiah 40, right? Where you have, it's a great chapter, Isaiah 40, talking about, about the bigness of God at the beginning. But at the end, he sees these youths, even the young men, they'll faint. And, and, and but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run, not be weary, walk, and not faint. Yeah, it's, it's God of the Old Testament that does that. Let me read just a bit to uh, just a bit from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. And then there's a list. He forgives all iniquities. He heals diseases. Who redeems thy life from destruction, crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, satisfies thy mouth with good things, and it goes on for 22 verses. God does good things. He knows who we are. He remembers our frame. He knows that we're just dust. 
he's understanding, he's tender-hearted, he's long-suffering, he is willing to help. He wants to help. He calls to us to let him help. Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. I remember preaching about that some time ago. Let me finish with this. What do you suppose is the best known chapter in the Bible? Now, this is perhaps a matter of opinion. What would you think? I mean, I haven't done any research, just, just anecdotal, right, from exam, from experience and, and what. Now, what do you think? Psalm 23. That's what I think. And that's sandwiched right between what? Matthew and Mark? That's somewhere in the writings of Paul? No. The best known, I think, chapter. Now, there may be other you know portions that are also well known. But the best known whole chapter, I think, is Psalm 23. That's my opinion. And all across this country and beyond, when people are suffering, when they are gathering to mourn the passing of someone that was dear to them, when they're looking for some kind of hope and some kind of comfort, where do they go? Psalm 23. Psalm 23. The Old Testament, where David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. He feeds me. He protects me. He comforts me. He nourishes me. He will be with me all through this sojourn. And ultimately, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The most comforting, the tenderest picture, the most all-encompassing description of care, it's found in the Old Testament. It's the Father. It's Jehovah. There's no difference between the two. And so, let me finish with this. And this is actually kind of on, on a tangent. Uh, but this is kind of it kind of grew out of a, another uh, thing that I prepared. Since God's almighty, you know, we, we get that. The rock crushing and planets flinging here and there and mountains and volcanoes and, and all that stuff, right? Since God is all powerful, that means he can do what? He can do anything. But not just looking at that on a big scale. How about on a small scale? What I mean by that is, if God can do anything, God can help me. God can comfort me when I'm sad. God can lift up my head when I'm depressed. Whatever I need, God is able to do that. He doesn't just specialize in big, dramatic things, but the small things as well. That's the same God, almighty, unchangeable God. 